Okay, this is lecture 11 or DES part 2, just a little bit more information on it. Okay, DES, they submitted the Lucifer algorithm in 1974. The original algorithm used 48 to 128 bit key, but we basically the NSA implemented a 50 or 64 bit key, which is 56 plus 8 bits for parity. If you don't know what parity is, think of it like a check, like a CRC check or something. Lucifer was altered to become the data encryption algorithm. Okay. Then it says they determined a need to protect sensitive data during 1960s. How many of you were born in the 60s? No, none of you? Chris, when were you born? It is Chris, isn't it? No, it's Clayton. Clayton, darn it. Mm. So close. Clayton, when were you born? Uh, 91. Wow. Anyone born before 91? When were you born, Josh? 87. 87. Well, let me tell you what was happening in 1962 when I was born. <laughs> I mean... When I graduated high school in 1980, literally the year I graduated, they got our first computer at the school. When I was submitting to work on my PhD, I had to provide a copy of my high school transcript. You know what that looked like? It was actually a microfiche copy. It was all handwritten. There was no printouts. So I'm trying to think, back in 1960s, when I was first born, there was nothing. Back in 1980s, we were just starting to get computers. But the NSA thought way back in the 60s, well, hey, we need to do something about this. Okay. 1970s started implementing a program. And now I'm 10 years old. Well, I guess eight years old at this point. And they, they, I just, it baffles me that when I was basically a high school senior, I got a CB radio. I'm assuming none of you have ever used a CB radio. That was the coolest thing in the world. That's what we had when I was a kid. That was like sweet. But these guys were actually implementing DES back then. It's just like, wow. Okay. They invite evangelists to submit some sort of algorithm techniques. IBM developed one. They did it to protect financial data. But I mean, financial data. I can't even imagine them having financial data back then. 1974, Lucifer was accepted. There was controversy about NSA requested it to be weakened, and if you read that book, you'll learn all about that. It's very interesting, the story on that. It became a standard in 1977 and an ANSI standard in 1998. It was implemented in the majority of commercial products that require cryptography, and it was used by lots of people. It was tested and approved as one of the strongest at that time. And IBM made lots of money because it was licensed through them. So kind of nice. Okay. It's a block symmetric algorithm. We know that. How big are the blocks? 64. How big is the key? 56. 56 bit. How many rounds? 16. Okay. So 64 gets broken into 232s. What happens to the left? Really nothing. It comes down and gets X. Where's the, left, the next left come from? The prior right, copy the right down, that becomes the next left. So, okay. You got the idea. Okay. Blocks of 64 bit are put through 16 rounds of transposition and substitution functions. Order and type is dictated by the key value, which is a shift. Okay. Government agencies used to protect sensitive by unclassified data. It was not used for connect, uh, protecting top secret data. All right. A couple different block modes. We'll do more on this here next week. But there's one called the electronic code book. The same ciphertext is always produced by the same plain text. So in other words, if I take some text and encrypt it with the key, I'm going to get the same ciphertext. Okay? It's not always a good thing. Easy to identify patterns. It's best when used with small amounts of data, and this is each key indicates a different code book. So by the key changes, that's considered a new code book. It usually was called methods authentication code, not, um, not a MAC address for integrity and authentication. So we have our plain text. It runs through our encryption algorithm with our key, and we get ciphertext. So we take the same plain text and the same key, what do we get? Same ciphertext. 
So if I keep running the same plain text with the same key, each time I'm getting the same ciphertext. You agree with that? Not necessarily a good thing. Now let's talk about cipher block chaining. See why this is better. Encryption is dependent on values from the previous block. Encrypts a 64-bit block, but XORs with the ciphertext of the preceding one. Okay? So we take some sort of vector, initialization vector. We XOR that with our plain text. Okay? So our initialization vector, uh, if, if you watch the imitation game, that's one reason they broke it, is they all said the Hi Hitler, whatever, at the beginning of the message, whatever. And that became the initialization vector. And that, along with the plain text, gets encrypted. Then that result gets XORed with the next plain text. So if I'm encrypting the same plain text every time, the results are not going to be the same. Because the first plain text is, is XORed with the initialization vector. The second plain text is XORed with the results of the first one. The third one is XOR with the results of the second one, and so on and so forth. So now it's not as easy to identify patterns. This one's a little bit better. Do you all agree with that? Okay, cipher block chaining. We're chaining the encryption. Okay? For decryption, we basically decrypt and then just XOR the initialization vector at the bottom. Okay? I think that's the end of this. All right. We will cover more on this next week.